Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, both free sites. It's Sunday, April the 8th, 2018. Let's talk about four fights that happened last night, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Just to understand, if you're ever watching one of my videos, I firmly believe, I firmly believe, that folks need to look hard at live underdogs. They need to look at casino mispricings. They need to figure out which underdogs have a shot. Sometimes you need to take long odds because quite frankly, in my opinion, over the long run, that's where the money is made. Now, Alfredo Angulo fought Sergio Mora. He was a plus 400. What that means is he's a four to one underdog. What the casino is telling you is that for every five times these guys fight, Mora should win four of them to every one that Angulo wins. Now, I haven't seen the fight. I'm going to invite people who saw the fight, which was not televised here in the United States, right? At least not as part of the main telecast on Showtime. I'm going to invite the public here to give us a rundown on what happened in the fight. Just know that my pick, Alfredo Angulo, the plus 400 underdog, lost the fight by split decision. Right now, I don't know whether the uh, judges were hard on Mora or were hard on Angulo. Just understand, though, that you should have hedged out of the play if you took the over, right? As I said in the pre-fight video, I hadn't seen casinos offer that. I didn't get the over, right? I lost on this play. But if you did, you took a swing at a plus 400 underdog, lost by split decision, the over would have saved you. Let's talk about Julian Williams versus Nathaniel Gallimore. Williams delivered for us. In my opinion, though, just going forward, if you're going to think about Williams in future fights, just understand, I thought Williams sparred a bit too much in the bout. He got lured into a shootout. I thought Williams didn't jab enough. In other words, he had the superior jab. In my opinion... When a guy has the superior jab and knows how to control distance, he should force the other guy to come up with some way to get by the jab before he puts himself at risk. Here, Julian Williams clearly showed, in my opinion, that he had the superior jab. He looks good early in the fight. Then, for some reason, testosterone takes over and he goes in and he starts trading. I thought that was a mistake. Don't get me wrong. He won the fight. He delivered for us. Right? But I thought he was a little bit too high risk. As for Nathaniel Gallimore, I understand his left hook is his Sunday punch. But he was a bit left hook happy and he couldn't set it up. In other words, he would stand there and try to launch off left hooks. Right? He wasn't the kind of guy who had something else going for him so that you're looking for the right hand or you're looking for some other punch, a stiff jab, then he slips in the left hook, right? I also thought, too, he was outthought by Williams. You'll notice on the film, there are times where Williams grabs Gallimore's left hand. In other words, Gallimore's million-dollar punch, Gallimore's a puncher, Gallimore's million-dollar punch, the other guy was actually able to tie it up. Gallimore left it dangling by his side too much. Picture this ever happening to Joe Fraser, right? Let me also say, too, that Gallimore, for a guy who's really predominantly one-handed, I was a little bit surprised that he squared up as much as he did. I felt he stood too upright, left his body too open. I also thought he wilted late in the fight, right? Williams almost gives the fight away in the middle of the fight, then comes on strong toward the end. Gallimore's going to have to figure out how to pace himself better, one man's opinion. Let's talk about another underdog 
I took yesterday who had his moments but did not win the fight. And understand, I have no problem with the scoring of this fight. It's Caleb Truax who went in as a greater than 3-1 to one underdog in the rematch against James DeGale. Now let me just pivot here for a second. You know, over the years of watching boxing, it takes a lot to impress me when a fighter walks in the ring, right? It's almost a cliche. The fighter is going to have some friend who's a rapper. They're going to pick some song that says, hey, I'm on top of the world. You know, um, I'm living in the penthouse. And then they're going to walk in the ring with entourage members who are nodding their heads to the beat. Isn't that what you hear most of the time? Well, here... Truax from Minnesota, University of Minnesota grad, comes in the ring to Prince's When Doves Cry, right? He picks one of the best known musicians from his state, and he just casually comes in the ring, and you notice, and it's low key, it's not even emphasized, you notice that he's wearing University of Michigan colors. Right, and he has a little M on his jersey. I thought it was one of the better ring entrances that I've seen this year. I'm a little bit older. I appreciate understated style. I did like the way Truax entered the ring. Okay, let's get back to the event. Understand, though, part of boxing is entertainment. Part of it is presentation. Now, I have... Even though it took food out of my mouth, I have no problem here with the scoring. For those who don't know, Truax, the 3-1 to one underdog, lost on two of the three scorecards by a 114 to 113 score. Right? Truax, believe it or not, on two of the three scorecards is actually winning the fight after 10 rounds. In other words, we were within two rounds of a plus 300. And Truax then loses the 11th and 12th rounds on all three judges' cards. This is in a fight where Truax throws and lands more punches than his opponent. But understand, I, I don't have a problem with the scoring. I thought the Gale had to dig deep for this one, and he did. And understand, Hall of Fame referee Robert Byrd makes a mistake. There's a headbutt early in the fight. It's important. Because if it's ruled a headbutt, it's the cut, it's the headbutt that opens up the cut on the gale that ends up bleeding profusely, right? To the point where both Al Bernstein and Paulie Malinaji, commentators for Showtime, end up with blood on them, right? Now, if the headbutt's ruled a headbutt, the gale in his corner could have called over the doctor before the end of the fourth round. And could have said, hey, look, this cut was caused by an illegal headbutt. If you feel my guy can't continue, and DeGale openly admits he couldn't see out of the eye after the headbutt, then the ref would have called the match a no contest, and they could have done it another day. But Robert Byrd makes a mistake. Robert Byrd ruled that the cut eye which is clearly caused by a headbutt on Phil, right, clearly, was caused by a punch. So here you have the Gale blind in one eye, bleeding badly, and his corner couldn't stop the fight. Understand, if they stop the fight on a cut caused by a punch, then the Gale would lose, <laughs> right? So... The Gale, being a champion, right, former champion at this point, before he regains his title, the Gale just goes through with the fight. Let me also say, too, the fight's close, right? It's, it's close, folks, and incredibly, incredibly, and I know the Gale was warned, but in a fight with several headbutts, there's a moment where DeGale pushes off with his shoulder. Doesn't even push Truax off of him. They're close together and DeGale does a veteran move. He pushes off with his shoulder. 
Believe it or not, because the Gale had been warned previously in a razor close fight that the Gale ends up winning by one round on two of the three judges' scorecards. The other judge had the Gale winning by a few rounds. Right? Robert Byrd deducted a point from the Gale. So, at that moment, with the Gale looking at losing the rematch, with the Gale down on the scorecards after 10, the Gale comes back and even on my scorecard. He wins the 11th round, and he wins the 12th round. Now, let me say, just to understand, and I know the fight's razor close, but life's unfair. You just saw a fight, the Lucas Brown, Dylan White fight, where Brown gets his eye banged up, and that's it. He can't see, can't see the punches coming. He gets beaten up, he gets jabbed to death. Right here, DeGale loses an eye. But you're talking about one of the best in boxing. Right? So DeGale is down an eye to a guy who's already beaten him. And DeGale starts switching hands. Right? You lose this eye. DeGale switches stances so he could see out of this eye. Right? DeGale's throwing a jab, a key part of his game. Right? This is a fight where he's not going to allow himself to get roughed up over by the ropes. Right? He's going to try to maintain distance. The punch he's going to do it with is going to be a jab. When you look at the film, you're going to understand James DeGale. DeGale, who at times is forced to switch his stance because he has blood bleeding down the side of his face goes from throwing a right jab to throwing a left jab on the move against a hyper-aggressive opponent, keeping the fight in the middle of the ring. Let me say this too. Truax riddles his body the first fight, right? Riddles it. So DeGale decides to hide his body. In this fight, he bends at the waist. These are the things that separate fighters. The Gale bends at the waist. He hides his body. He hides his head. Right? So you get some unfortunate headbutts in this fight. I don't believe they're intentional. Where you'll notice Truax, who's a front foot heavy guy, is coming up to James Gale. And the Gale is bent over so much that the Gale's head comes up from down here and headbutts Truax, right? Hits Truax in the teeth, the top of the Gale's head. In other words, the Gale is so up and down that the Gale for portions of this fight, a fight in which he's bleeding and struggling, he's coming in at low angles. Right? As I watched the fight, knowing that I would win 3-1 to one. <laughs> on Drew X. Let's just say as I watched the fight, as I watched the Gale really struggling to try to get his title back in a fight in which he's bleeding. And then hearing that he's been deducted a point, I had to tip my hat to him. You know, I thought, if you're a champion... And you're going to try to win your title back. This is how you do it. Right? When the fight's been a complete disaster. Right? Understand, this is a rough and tumble fight. Not a lot of clean punches landed. But I have to concede the cleanest punches I saw landed were landed by a bleeding James DeGale. Right? Understand, though, just like the Angulo fight. You should have hedged out of this. In other words, you stood to more than triple your money if Truax won the fight. But the hedge of the over held because the Gale ultimately wins the fight by decision. Now let's talk about a fight that was interesting. And again, I don't have a problem with the scoring of the fight. For those who don't know, I had Erislandi Lara 
over Jared Hurd. I understand that Showtime scored the fight for Laura. The judges did not understand that if Hurd doesn't get a knockdown in the last minute of the 12th round, the fight officially would have been a draw. Let me just say this first. Right, and this depends on how you view boxing. I have no problem with Hurd winning the fight. I thought the fight was close. Right, I thought the fight was close. When you see a fight like this that's this close, in my opinion, they could give it to either guy. So, officially Hurd wins by split decision. One judge saw it for Lara. Right? The other two judges saw it for Heard by a one-round margin. Right? So this is a razor-close fight. I thought Lara threw the cleaner punches. Lara's the better technician. Lara had the better defense. Lara's landing power shots almost at will. In other words, his connect percentage on power shots was greater than 40%. But the problem with Lara, who was the smaller man in this fight, and who was comfortable with his back up against the ropes, who was comfortable with the other man throwing more punches than him, right? Herd's less efficient, but Herd's more active. The problem with Laura is Laura is so much of a technician that Laura is unaware of the optics and it hurts him. This is not the first fight this has happened to Laura in, right? The Paul Williams fight comes to mind in terms of an opponent who's taller than him, throwing heavy volume, less efficient than Laura, Laura pot shotting him, counter punching him with precision and believing that the judges were then going to say, well, who's the more precise fighter? Who's the one landing the cleaner punches? So Laura allows the bigger man to look like he's walking him down. You know the way counter punchers operate, you know, it's like Ali with his back up against the ropes. It's like Floyd Mayweather against Maidana, right? Laura just seemed to believe that in a title unification match against a bigger, younger, higher volume co-champion, that the judges would appreciate his greater than 40% accuracy rate on power shots. Right? Laura needs to be more in tune with his audience. He needs to understand that many people are going to view this fight as blood and guts. And they're going to say, okay, Laura's landing at a higher percentage. But who's landing more? Right? Who's bullying who over to the ropes? Right? Let me say, too. That Law is a pot shotter. He's not a combination puncher. And that's important here. Because Laura would land great shots. Then he'd move away. Right? Now that's the opposite. Literally, the polar opposite of Jared Hurd. You know, Jared Hurd, as big as he is, as front foot heavy as he is, Jared Hurd's a combination puncher. So if Jared Hurd hit you with a right hand to the body and that punch lands clean, Hurd's going to double up. Hurd's going to triple up. If you then try to stop him from hitting you with that right hand to the body, he's coming back with the left hand. Right? Whatever opening Hurd gets... He's going to try to blow it wide open. He's going to try to capitalize. He's not going to hit you with a great shot. Then suddenly, back away. Move off at the side. Assume that the judges are going to say, well, 
Hurd won that exchange. No, Hurd's mindset's different. He hits you with a good shot. His mindset is, hey, I've heard it. I'm going to try to take him out. The judges, who are they? I don't want this fight going to the judges. You sensed the urgency with Jared Hurd. Let me also say this too. They said something on the Showtime telecast that surprised me. Because Hurd looks like what I call an arm puncher. Right? In other words, he's not really leaning into shots. He's not a guy who throws his whole body into shots. It looks like he's upright and he's throwing punches with his arms. But Austin Trout fought both of these guys. And even though Trout looked very bad against Eris Landy Lauer, got hit with some huge shots, at least that's how it looks on film, Austin Trout told Showtime that he thought Heard hit harder than Lara. Right, so you see Heard there, and Heard's throwing what looks like arm shots. But then you notice Lara's wincing, Lara's freezing. Understand, too, that Laura, defensive wizard, excellent, just like Floyd Mayweather. But in the entire career that Floyd Mayweather had, we're talking about 49 fights, Mayweather never had a puffed-up eye that looked like Laura's eye looked yesterday. In other words, the judges were looking at great defense, but they were also looking at punches getting through, and they understood that just by looking at the swelling on Laura's face. Let me say this, too. Laura gets hit with a 1-2 in the 12th round. Right? Heard hits him with the right hand. Right hand doesn't look like much. But understand the whole purpose of the right hand is to move Lara into the left hand. Now, in Hurd's style, he hits him with the left. And Hurd's upright. Doesn't look like he's leaning into the shot. I'm just telling you, Lara goes down hard. I'm just telling you that Lara is lucky that the referee who did a great job, Kenny Bayless. By the way, please sign Kenny Bayless up for the next heavyweight title fight. Please give us give us a real good ref. Laura's lucky that Kenny Bayless allowed the fight to continue. What I want people to do is to look at the film. Kenny, who's smooth, looks Laura in the eyes, tries to talk to Laura. Right now, there is a little bit of a language gap. Now, I get the feeling Laura speaks English fine, Right? Uh, Ronnie Shields is his trainer. Ronnie Shields speaks English. <laughs> right? Laura hangs out with a bunch of English-speaking fighters. But Laura prefers to speak Spanish. More power to him. But Kenny Bayless looks at his eyes, and Kenny Bayless tries to talk to him. And Laura, to me, looks dazed and confused. He looked shaky, folks. Now, I'll say this. Thank God it's a ref who's one of the best in the business who, in my opinion, is going to end up in the Hall of Fame because Kenny Bayless understood that less than a minute was left in the fight. I believe Bayless understood that this was a title unification match. I believe Bayless being in the ring had to understand that this fight was razor close. So Bayless did the right thing. In my opinion, Laura's on shaky feet. But Bayless gives Laura the opportunity to try to keep his title. Now that last round, 10-8 in favor of Jared Hurd, tips the fight to Jared Hurd. Right? I have no complaints whatsoever with the scoring. Right? I thought Laura decided that he was not going to move. That he was going to stand and trade with Hurd. Right? 
I'm sure when he was trading with Hurd and he's landing some power shots, he thought to himself, look, I'm landing enough to continue to stand and trade with Hurd. I thought that was a mistake. If you're fighting a guy, whether it's Caleb Truax or Jared Hurd, and the guy's a bit too front foot heavy, right? The guy isn't interested in a back foot game. He's always coming forward. He's always throwing punches. He always wants to mix it up. In my opinion, his opponent should want to reveal the guy as being too one-dimensional. In other words, you know, Lara didn't have to run. Lara's a master at lateral movement. He could have circled Jared Hurd. He could have turned Jared hurt a bit, right? Also, what's wrong with moving on your back foot in the middle of the ring like James DeGale did against an equally front foot heavy Caleb Truax? Instead, I believe Laura decided, hey, I'm going to trade with this guy. This guy's less efficient than me. Over time, his lack of efficiency is going to cost him. That led to the fight being fought at a fever pitch, a pace that favored the guy on his front foot, Jared Hurd, who wanted to increase the pace. Right, so, just like the James DeGale fight, the Laura Jared Hurd fight could have gone either way. Right, it could have. I think it's poetic that had Laura not hit the canvas in the last round. The fight likely would have been officially a draw. As it is, even with him hitting the canvas, Showtime had Laura winning the fight. Right? But the fact that Laura couldn't stay away in the 12th round from a guy who he knew was coming to hunt him down, and the fact that he still got caught speaks volumes speaks volumes about the stamina and tenacity of Jared Hurd. So let me congratulate Jared Hurd and James DeGale on gut check performances in very, very difficult and razor close fights, right? Those two fights had four scorecards that were 114-113. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me say this, too, about DeGale. You know, I feel that George Groves is a better fighter when healthy than Callum Smith. I would have taken Groves over Callum Smith. The problem is, I feel there's a bit of a cover-up. I'm watching Groves against Chris Eubank. Groves has the fight in hand. We get to that last round, and one of Groves' arms was unusable. Groves was a one-handed fighter. The problem with these trick shoulders is that they could snap out at any time. Right? Against a young lion like Callum Smith, who's really there for the KO, Right, Callum Smith is going to be on his front foot, folks. Right, Callum Smith is going to try to take it out of the hands of the judges. To me, it's just too much risk to have this be Groves' next fight right after the Eubanks fight. So, I'm on the sidelines for the Callum Smith-George Groves fight. Right? I'm not, I'm not making a pick right now. So I'll say this. DeGale wants a rematch, as you can imagine, with George Groves. Because George Groves beat DeGale not only as a professional, but also as an amateur. Right? And at this stage of the game, where DeGale's, you know, had a multi-year run as champ, now has regained his title, for DeGale, it's about settling old scores. Right? He's been champ. If he quits today, they'll have to say in his obituary that he was once world champion. 
right? So DeGale wants to fool around with George Groves. As you can imagine, DeGale also has unfinished business with light heavyweight champion Badu Jack, right? Because DeGale was in a fight where he was on his way to beating Badu Jack. And then Jack drops him. Jack got his own 10-8 round in the last round. And that fight was officially ruled a draw. So just understand how crazy boxing is. If Badu Jack, whose next fight is against Adonis Stevenson, if Badu Jack beats Stevenson, and I like Stevenson in that fight, by the way, but if Badu Jack beats Stevenson, you're going to have a situation where the champion at 168, James DeGale, fought the current champion at 175, unified champion, Badu Jack, and the guys would have fought to a draw. So you could just imagine the box office that fight would generate. Let me point out, too, that DeGale, who beat Andre Durrell back in the day in Boston, who beat Lucien Boutte in Canada, who just won his title back in Las Vegas, DeGale's a world traveler. He's not afraid to cross an ocean for a big fight. So pay close attention to James DeGale because he has options. He has possible big fights on the horizon. Let me point out, too, there's an unbeaten champion at 168 pounds. Unbeaten. Right? In fact, right now, the boxing cognoscenti is saying, which one? Right? I'm talking about Gilberto Ramirez. That'd be a fascinating fight for DeGale because Ramirez is boxing's, one of boxing's more underrated jabbers. Right? The question would be whether DeGale could actually corner Ramirez, who's tall, has a great jab, and knows how to use it. Also, there's David Benavides. One of the better moments of the fight here was as the Gale was leaving the ring, <laughs> he actually walked up to Benavides, and the guys talked to each other. I would have loved to have known what those two guys had to say. So let's just say James DeGale has gone from a fight where he said, if I lose this, I'm quitting, to now having several high-profile, possibly high-box office fights on his dossier. Right? Boxing continues to amaze. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. If you have a take on any of the fights I've mentioned, if you have a take on any of the future fights, and I understand, Jared Hurd wants Jamel Charlo. Right? That's an interesting fight. I'm leaning toward Hurd right now. Right? I'm not completely sold on Charlo's win over Erickson Lubin, even though it was a first-round knockout. Right, But if, if there are other fights on the horizon that you want to discuss concerning these fighters, in the comment section to this video, let's have the talk. I hope you do so. Thanks for stopping by.